what can possibly happen next? And, I, and there are things that just perplex me that are going on in the world today. How to thrive in Babylon. And last week we talked quite a bit about what it was like to be in Babylon. And we talked about how Babylon of that day is not much different than the Babylon of today. However, I will tell you, things were a lot different in terms of the violence and the culture that Daniel was in. I, I, I didn't get a chance to really explain this last week, but one of the reasons why Daniel and his cohorts were taken into Babylon is whenever Nebuchadnezzar came in and he took over a kingdom, one of the things he would do is he would set up a new king. And after he set up that new king, then he would take some of the nobility from that area and take them back to Babylon. And that's what he did with Daniel and his three friends. He took them back to, uh, back to Babylon with them to train them and to teach them. And then if there was an uprising in Jerusalem or in another city, he would send the heads back of the people that he had taken with them saying, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't settle down. This was not the kind of king you messed with. As a matter of fact, if you know the history of uh, the Babylonian Empire, they were brutal at times. So the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because you've got to understand, uh, and you'll see it in your notes and introduction, there is a historical perspective of what's going on here. And as there is a historical perspective, we can look back at history. We can read the history books that were written. We can read secular books that were written about what was going on at this time. The Babylonian Empire had basically pushed the Syrian army to the extent that Syria was no longer a place anymore. And the Egyptian army was also pushed out of place, and they were pushed all the way back to North Africa at this time. So it was very easy for Nebuchadnezzar to walk in and take over Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was not a fortified city like you would think of of fortified cities. So it was very easy for Nebuchadnezzar to come in there and take over that city. But in doing so, he went through and he picked some of the best of the best. And we can see from this account that we have right here that there is a historical perspective of what's going on. But what we need to realize, number two, is that there is also a heavenly perspective of what's going on. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because a lot of times we think Things happen outside of the realm of God. And I'm going to tell you today that nothing happens outside the realm of God. If you look in your Bibles, and you can turn to this later, in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 36 through chapter 24 and verse 4, you will see the prediction of this happening to Jerusalem. And it happened because Jerusalem was not following after God's law. And it is predicted what's going to happen and how long they're going to be in captivity. As a matter of fact, the prophet of Jeremiah uh, in the book of Lamentations is all about what was about to happen to Israel and its warnings to them. And I cannot help but think that Daniel as a boy, because of his position in the kingdom of Israel, had read the prophets Jeremiah and he had read the things that had gone on in the Chronicles of the Kings, and he knew what was about to take place. So he was preparing himself before he ever got into Babylon. Now, here we have four young men. That's what mostly the book is about. Four young men who are probably 15 to 18, somewhere in there. They're off into a foreign country. Now, there are some people that think that Daniel and his friends were made eunuchs. I don't know if that's the case or not. But there's a good possibility that they were made eunuchs at this time. They are smart young men, and they are trying to follow what God wants them to do. And all of a sudden, they have been captured. And they've gone on this 700-mile trip in wagons probably, and got to this new place, and they are being taught at Babylon University. 
So they are in the schools there. They are learning witchcraft. They are learning sorcery. They are learning about how to uh, interpret dreams and all the things that go along with that. And as they are learning all of these things, they have some issues that come up. Now, I want you to understand there's four mega themes in the book of Daniel as you read through it. The first mega theme is that God is in control. God is in control. There's a lot of times that the things that are going on around us, around the world, we get a little upset. Amen? Do you ever watch the news and just after you've watched the news for a little bit saying, you know, isn't this a great time to be alive? Don't you do that? Or do you, are you like me, you watch the news and you think, what can possibly happen next? And, I, and there are things that just perplex me that are going on in the world today. But what Daniel had going on is no different than what we were going on. I'm sure Daniel was thinking, hey, I've got it, I'm far away from my family and, and I'm only here with these guys and I'm in a strange place learning strange things and eating strange food. What could happen next? But the major theme, one of the major themes of the book of Daniel is that God is in control even when it seems like everything else is out of control. Look at your notes. Our faith is secure because our future is secure. Daniel knew from the prophets and what he read in the Chronicles of Kings, he knew what was going to happen and he knew how long it was going to last. I'm here to tell you today, folks, our future is secure and that no matter what happens in this country or no matter what's happening in the world or no matter what's happening immediately around us, God is still in control. Second thing I want you to see is the power of a purpose. The mega theme is that a power of a purpose makes a difference. I believe with all of my heart that some of us are not fulfilling our life's purpose because we're not following what God wants us to do. A man lives by, belief, a man lives by believing something, not by debating or arguing about many things. We need to remember and we need to believe that God is in control, that God is sovereign, that God is with us, and He has a purpose for our lives. I'm teaching the teens, and one of the things that I want so much for our teens to gather in the classes is that you have a purpose in this life. You were not just put here to enjoy life. You were put here with a purpose. Number three, the challenge for us is to be in the world, but not of the world. The challenge for us today is to be in the world, but not of the world. You see, we let culture influence us instead of us influencing culture. I was talking to Joel today, and I don't know where Joel's mind went to, but as I was talking to Joel today, he says, Neil, I remember that it was very risque when I was growing up for a woman to have her dress above her knees. And I started shaking my head. He says, in school, we had to have, the girls had to have their dresses go two inches. And they took a ruler and measured to make sure their dresses were two inches below their knees. And I know some of you are thinking, well, that's hard to believe. But I can see enough people in here going, yep, I remember those days. And now it's barely covering their backside. The world has changed and we need to learn that we need to be in the world, but not of the world. It says there is a major difference between a be being a boat in the water and a water being in the boat. And that's what we need to remember. Number four, God is faithful. Anything less than God will let you down, E. Stanley Jones. One of the things that I'm trying to teach people and get people to understand is their relationship with God does make a difference. In our class this morning, we had a visitor there, and I asked him, I said, do you trust me? And he said, yes, a little. <laughs> and I understand that because he doesn't know me. He has not been around me that much. And so how can he trust me? 
And in order for us to trust God, we have to have a relationship with Him. And that relationship is built over time. And the more you're trusting in God, the more you're faithful to God, the more you will trust Him later. And in trusting Him, it will make a difference in your life and in your future. So the biblical principle that you need to get today is God is faithful in His blessings and His judgments. There will come a day that God is going to judge what we do, but He is faithful in His blessings as well as His judgment. And they are given to us according to our obedience or disobedience. And you need to remember that today because what you do today is going to have an effect on the future. How you react to what God has commanded you to do today is going to have an effect on your future. And I know for a lot of us, it's not easy sometimes for us to be able to trust God when we're in the heat of the battle. But God says, if you will trust me in these things and you will be obedient in these things, I will make a blessing for you. I'm going to just tell you right now, the biggest struggle I had in my entire life was money. It was always my struggle. I didn't realize it, but because I grew up in a home where we did not have a lot of money, and at 12 years of age, I went out and I got a job cutting my neighbor's grass over the summer so I could buy my school clothes. And the reason why I did that is um, my, uh, my older brother, he's about the same height as me, but he's about twice as big as me. And I don't know if any of y'all remember hand-me-downs. That was a thing that happened back when I was young, uh, where you, your brother got the clothes, and then when he grew out of them, then you got the clothes. Well, can you imagine me going to school with pants that were this big, and I had to cinch them up? So at 12 years of age, I was determined that I was going to go out and make money, and I was still determined for many, many years that money was a driving factor in my life. And it wasn't until I learned to trust God that money has not been a driving factor. It's still something that's important to me, and it's still something I fight with because I, you know how it is, how much is ever enough? It's always a little bit more, amen? And we're here to tell you that we need to learn to trust God in every aspect of our life. It may not be finances for you, it may be your health. It it may not be your health, it may be your relationships in your family. But you've got to learn to trust God in every area of your life. And in doing so, you will be obedient to Him. And in that obedience, you will find the blessings. Now, Daniel was in an interesting situation. And we have in here verses 8 through 16. And that is the crux of our lesson today. It said, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now Daniel had caused the official to show favor. Now God has caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid the Lord, the king who has assigned you food and drink, why he should see you looking worse than the other young men your age. The king would then have my head because of you. And he is not being facetious here. He is being literal. So Daniel doesn't want to have the choice food. I I don't know how Daniel decided what he didn't want to do and what he didn't want to do. But I'm going to tell you, he had all of these things laid out before him. This was from the king, and the king says, these are the foods these young men are going to have. This is what they're going to eat, and this is what they're going to drink. And Daniel says, you know, I don't think that's what God wants for us. I, I don't believe that that's what God wants or intends for us to do right now. How he came up with that, I have no idea. I, I can imagine that he and his, his cohorts there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were all standing around one day, and they was like, you know, we've got this food here that we're supposed to eat, but we know that God does not want us to eat certain foods. And we need to figure out a way in the middle of this culture that we're living in how to be obedient to God in a way that's respectful, but also obedient to God. 
So he gets his buddies together and it says, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, uh, Hanaran, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. I don't know about you, but this had to have been a really, really tough temptation. I mean, you think about what we like in this generation today. One of the things that I got to do with uh, uh, Tyler and Matthew and his, uh, his girlfriend, Aaron is we got to take Tyler out. Tyler's getting ready to turn 30. Can you believe Nancy has a child that's 30? Um, I mean, it just blows my mind that she's that old. But uh, anyway, we, we, we got to go out last week and, and uh, have dinner together, at the four of us, and we went to this place called the Boathouse. And I mean, it was really nice. It's on the St. James River. It's about three stories up in the air, and it overlooks the river, and you can see downtown way off. And I'm going to tell you, it was some choice food that we had that night. And we celebrated together. And can you imagine living a life like that all the time? It had to have been difficult to say, hey, I'm not going to be eating the king's food because what the king has in there are some things that God has forbidden us to, to eat. And, and I'm not going to drink the king's choice wine because God has forbidden me to get drunk. So I, I'm going to have to make a stand here. And so he calls his buddies together and he says, hey, look, I got this idea. Why don't we go to the guy that's over us and just talk to him? Just see if we can get him to agree to something and, and, and just give us vegetables and water. Now, I don't know where you are on your dietary palate, but, you know, I, I mentioned a few weeks ago that I don't like Brussels sprouts and I have not heard the end of it yet. Some of you have invited me over for Brussels sprouts, which I denied. Some of you are just, you know, you're into Brussels sprouts and you don't understand me. Let, let me just say this to you. If you're somebody that eats vegetables and that's what you like to eat, God bless you. And I hope you understand better what it's like to have a steak one day. But there had to have been some temptation there. Have, have you ever been on a diet and you walk into a room where somebody's cooking something that's not on your diet and it smells really good? I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because I don't think it's just as simple as, oh, we just want vegetables and water. I think they had to make a conscious decision. They had to take a stand in this moment. And, and I'm going to tell you that a lot of times it's taking the stand on the little things in the moment that makes the biggest difference down the road. They took a stand here, and this is what happened. Number one, it says, Daniel, uh, your notes say, Daniel modeled the character, overcome temptation and pressure. He was resolved, in verse 8, it says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself. And I think for a lot of us, the reason why we don't over, under, uh, overcome temptation, we're not overcomers, so to speak, is because we haven't resolved in our hearts not to let something happen. It's one of the things that I taught my boys when they were growing up, when they went on their dates. I said, you have to resolve before you ever get there. You have to decide before you ever get in the car with this young lady where you're going and what you're going to do and how it's going to look at the end of the night. Because if you don't decide beforehand, there's no telling what could happen. And one of the things that, that they did on a consistent basis that they never realized is we made sure, Nancy and I made sure when they were going out on dates, Nancy and I made sure that we just hugged them and hugged them and hugged them before they went out on their date. By the time they were going out on their date, they didn't want anybody to touch them. 
They never knew. They couldn't figure that out. They just thought we were loving parents every time they had a date. But we made them decide, Daniel decided here, that he was not going to eat the king's food. His decision was personal, it was private, and it was immediate. The second opportunity is always more difficult than the first when the first has been refused. I know you don't believe this, but I have dealt since I was a teenager with anger issues. It's just hard to believe, isn't it? That somebody like me could have anger issues. But I do. I sometimes get angry, and I get angry pretty quick. Now, I've been working on it my whole life. I remember being uh, the father of two boys and getting mad and looking at my sons, and they were like, what happened to the man that we thought was our father? Have you ever gone down the road, and you just got angry, and you start talking to the car next to you, and you think, I must look like an idiot? Or have you ever seen me driving, talking to the car, and say, he looks like an idiot? Or somebody like me? The reason why I'm telling you this is not just because I need to confess that I have anger issues, but I'm telling you this. One of the key things that I've learned about anger is that when I control my anger, the next time it's easier to control my anger. But if I don't control my anger, the next time it's harder to control my anger. In this Daniel is setting himself up for the opportunities that are going to come ahead of him. He's setting himself up to be trustworthy to the Lord, to be obedient to the Lord, not just this time, but the next time. The second thing is that he was daring, but respectful. He was daring, but he was respectful. Look at what it says in verse 12. Please. He didn't say, hey, we're not going to eat this stuff. You can't make me eat that. He says, please test your servants. Wait a minute, Daniel. Do you not understand that you have rights? Do you not understand, Daniel, that you can just say, hey, I'm not going to do that. Do whatever you will with me. No, Daniel went at this. He was very daring in what he was asking, but he was very respectful. He says, please test your servants. Not, hey, It's all about me, and you need to listen to my rights and my ways. He asked respectfully. Number three, he had a plan. It says, at the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. In doing this, Daniel had an issue. It doesn't seem like a big issue, but it was an issue that started Daniel on the trajectory that he was going to have for the rest of his life. He outlives four kings because of this decision that he made early on in his life. He has been given wealth. He is going to be given wealth and prominence during his time here on this earth because of a decision he made early on in life to do the right thing and be obedient to God. Teens, if you're listening to me this morning, every decision that you make today is going to make a difference about your future. Every step in one direction, either towards God or away from God, is going to make a difference about your future. And it doesn't matter how old you are, but if you're in the listening sound of my voice, if you take a step away from God today, it's going to make a difference in your future. And if you take a step away from God, or step towards God, it's going to make a difference in your future. And that's what Daniel's teaching us. Then it says, to those four, this is God's provision, To those four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. You ever feel like you'd like greater knowledge? I I listen to a lot of different podcasts and and some of them are good, some of them are not so good. And I, I listen to books on tape because I'm, I'm in my car quite a bit. And, and one of the things I like to do at night when uh, Nancy's gone to sleep is I like to listen to things, that just all kinds of things. Uh, whether it's, uh, I've got a friend that's 
got me learning some stuff about quantum physics. Now, why am I learning that? I have no idea because it's never going to come into play for me. But I think it's kind of like algebra. It's something I need to know, right? You remember saying that to your algebra teacher, when am I going to use this? Well, some of you do, but most of us don't. My point being is it would be great to have more knowledge and more understanding. Amen? And we can get that because of our obedience to God. Do you realize that there are people of the world that do not know things? I mean, these are people in power. These are people that we have elected as officials. These are people that are are running our country, running different parts of the world. These are people that are in big corporations. You realize they don't know some things that you know? Like, number one, God is in control. They don't know that. But when we're obedient to God, we can find all kinds of things that the rest of the world don't, doesn't know. It says, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief officials presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Na Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered into the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. I've got three observations, and then the lesson is yours. Number one, God's provision was the direct result of faithfulness. God's provision was the direct result of their faithfulness. You see, if you want God's provision in your life, you can't just say, God, please help me here. He wants you to be faithful so that he can give you what he needs. And I can guarantee you, Daniel and his friends, when they were going through this, they probably didn't think to themselves, oh, you know what? If, if, if we don't eat the choice food, if we make a decision here, then God's going to grant all this other stuff to us. They didn't think about that. Instead, they were focused on what God said was true and what God wanted them to do. And as they focused on those things, God's provision took place. And I know there's some of us are living in this world today and we're thinking, how is God going to fix this and God says, you be faithful, and when you're faithful, I will show you things you just can't believe. The second thing is their faithfulness today prepared them for the work of tomorrow. I remember as a child, uh, I think I was nine years old, when I had to get up in front of the congregation where um, my dad preached. It was on a Wednesday night. On Wednesday nights, uh, we had a short period of time and uh, in the, the area that I grew up in, one of the things that, that you had to do as you turned into a young man is you had to get up on a Wednesday night and you had to give a lesson. And so you, and, and I, I'll never forget, my father, he did not give us any choice in this matter. It wasn't, do you want to do this? It was, you are going to do this and here's how you're going to do it. And we got up in front of people when I was nine years old, and I, I remember hating every minute of it. I, I remember thinking, I don't have anything to say to these people. I, for the most part, I, I don't even like most of them. But I got up there, and I did my first talk, and I learned all the tricks. People told me, hey, when you're speaking to people in public, you just need to imagine everybody in their underwear, which was really bizarre to me. How are you going to talk to people in your underwear? I don't even want to see people in their underwear. How are you going to talk to them? And then, you know, the other thing is, you know, if, if you've got butterflies, you just get them to fly in formation. What does that mean? All these people that had advice and not, not I never saw one of them get up and speak in front of people. But I can tell you that I'm standing before you today because of the decisions that my father made for me and that I followed through with year after year and i'm standing before you today because of the fact that my faithfulness back then prepared me for what i'm doing today number three their faithfulness influenced the king and future generations we were uh, going down 
Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. Some of you know about what's happened up there. They've torn down all the monuments. A couple of weeks ago, they took down the very last statue of, of Robert E. Lee. And, and I don't know where you stand on any of that. It doesn't really, really matter. But I think that because they've taken all the monuments down through there, they should call it Podium Avenue because all that's left is podiums out there. But I, I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you in this is that I thought it was very interesting. Robert E. Lee was the one man from the Confederacy that said, I do not want any monuments to me. And his was the very last monument that was taken down. And, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because I don't want any monuments to me. I, I don't care even about having a headstone someplace. I, I don't care about any of that. As a matter of fact, I've told Nancy that when I die, and I've told our kids this in case Nancy doesn't want to fulfill it, that maybe they will. I said, when I die, just have me cremated and just sprinkle my ashes over the church. That way I can haunt you forever. <laughs> That's all I want. Daniel, we don't know where he's buried. Daniel, we don't even know if he had a gravesite. But Daniel has influenced generation after generation because of what he did. And if you want to influence the world for eternity, make the right choices today. Make the right choices today. And as I was thinking about this, I remembered a passage in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And I want to tie these two together because I think this is probably what happened. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of Herod, my guy from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? When they saw his star in the east, uh, we, have saw, we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. I believe with all of my heart that Daniel had prophesied enough and he had taught enough in his time that there were wise men that were from the east that came in to look for Jesus because they knew that he had been promised through some of the visions and some of the dreams that, that actually Daniel had interpreted. Now, each Lord's Day we sing an invitation song and we sing that invitation song to give you a chance to decide you get a chance to decide this morning. You get a chance to resolve in your heart who you're going to be. You see, I can leave here this afternoon and I can be whatever I want to be. God has given me free will to go home this afternoon and I can be a heathen. I don't think I'm going to do that, but there's a possibility, right? Or I can decide this afternoon that I am going to resolve myself. I'm going to find ways in my life that I can better honor and obey God. But the decision's up to us. You see, God gives us free will. Daniel was not made to do any of this. Daniel could have looked at his circumstances and you know, said, Well, this is where I am. I don't have any choice in the matter. The king's authority is over me, and I am going to just do whatever the king says, and I'm going to get through all of this. Or, or maybe Daniel was in class with his other teens that he was with, and all the other teens are doing it, so it must be okay. All the other teens are acting this way, so it must be okay. But maybe Daniel... And his friends just said, hey, you know what? No matter how the rest of the world's going to act, I'm going to follow God and I'm going to be different. So today, whether you're a teen or you're an adult, when you leave here, you have to resolve how you're going to live the rest of your life. It doesn't really matter to the rest of the world how you live the rest of your life because the world is going to come and it's going to go. Two people it's going to matter to is one is you and two is God. But if you resolve correctly, you can influence future generations. If you resolve correctly, God will bless you. If you resolve correctly, you can know peace and you can know joy that the leaders of this world and the richest people of this world will never know. But you have to resolve correctly. The invitation is yours. 
as we stand and sing.